Uh, hi, uh, we are very happy to be sitting with uh, Clay Epstein and uh, the, the, the founder of Film Mode and the uh, chairperson of IFTA. And uh, I'd like to have him uh, uh, give a few words of uh, explanation of what it is uh, that the, the members are looking into when they uh, re become members and uh, what's up uh, in this year's edition. Well, thank you, Bruno, for having me. My name is Clay Epstein, and I am chairperson of IFTA, which is the Independent Film and Television Alliance. We are an alliance of almost 150 companies worldwide. We have a global membership of distribution companies and worldwide sales companies. We're the only organization in the world that has the best interests of the independents, truly. And we're here at AFM 2022, the first in-person market since 2019. So we cannot be happier. Everyone's here in beautiful Santa Monica, California. We're here at the Lowe's Hotel where companies are taking rooms and offices all over the hotel. We have distributors flying in from all over the world and we have sales agents flying in from all over the world. We have an incredible producer seminar series as well that's happening all week. So we have producers flying in from all over the world. And basically what I'm saying is this is the place to be if you are an independent filmmaker. What would be uh, the one uh, tip you'd give to someone coming in uh, for the first time to AFM and uh, with a film in his pocket? One of the best tips to give first time attendees at the AFM is actually to watch an incredible video that we did. So yeah. I was had the pleasure of uh, being on a panel with the uh, president of IFTA and a couple of other experts in the business and executives in the business. And we did a fantastic seminar about, about I think it was about a month ago. Yeah. We had several hundred attendees that were registered and some that were thinking about registered and eventually did. And this was kind of like the top 10 tips to expect how to prepare for the market. And I think one of the, one of the few tips, if I can um, you know, plant a few, few thoughts in your mind, is preparation is key, yeah. right? Now, of course, if you're seeing this video and you want to hop on a plane and get here by Wednesday, I would encourage you to do so. But if you do have time or you did have time and if you plan properly for next year, preparation is key. And what I mean by that is if you have a project that you are planning on getting a sales agent for or want to talk to uh, people in the industry about, prepare the materials, have your information in hand, have your script ready to go well developed with a nice cover page, put together a presentation deck, um, reach out for meetings beforehand. You know, most of us that come to AFM are preparing for weeks in advance. We've been preparing for this market for over a month, well over a month. And we come here with pretty much a full schedule. So if you're coming here and expecting to talk with a sales agent or an acquisition executive, and you don't have a scheduled meeting, you may not get a chance to meet with the people you want to meet with. So I think that first key is preparation. Prepare the materials and prepare your trip to the AFM. But you never know. I mean, don't be shy. And uh, if you build it, they will come. So It's true. I said you may not get a meeting yes. with an acquisition executive. <laughs> right. I didn't say you won't get an, a meeting with an acquisition executive. Because life is about timing, isn't it? Right. So. And we are in the movie business and things can happen that you don't expect. Uh, so again, if you're seeing this and you haven't made a decision to come out, I encourage you to come to AFM uh, in Santa Monica. If you're already in California, of course, it's easier to come than if you're not. But the, the event lasts all the way through Saturday of next week. And I do confirm watching the tape uh, you put up last month is, uh, is absolutely vital. Everyone should see it. It's full of uh, very practical tips and Thank uh, recommendations. You. Thank you, Maybe you can add a link to the. I will. Uh, add a link to this link. For uh, filmfestivals.com yeah, viewers. You. Yeah. So it's good to be back, right? And uh, Excellent to be back. Uh, we're throwing the biggest party in Santa Monica. We've all been deprived of our face to face meetings. We are in the entertainment business, right? We are not uh, in the business of selling shower curtains online on an e-commerce site. We are selling movies, we're selling dreams, uh, and we're selling the hope of success and vision. You cannot do that effectively if you are not face-to-face -face with your colleagues and clients and filmmakers and talent. Yeah. Um, Clay, if you don't mind, I'd like to hear a little bit about your role, um, IFTA, and, and, and uh, 
as an advisor and a board of director, what, uh, what's your mission there? Yeah, so my, so like I said before, I'm chairperson, it's an elected position. Right. So IFTA has a board of directors uh, made up of executives in the entertainment independent space. Uh, you have to be, a, be an employee of a member company in good standing to be able to run for the board. Uh, there are board elections every year. The terms run two years. I was elected chairperson a year ago, and so I just started my second year of my first term as chairperson. But I've been on and off the board of directors through the years. Uh, even when I was quite early in my career, I was working for a company that was a member company. Um, and I kind of describe it as a student council for, for the professional independent movie space. Um, I believe in the cohesiveness of our industry which is uh, in some ways um, contradicting to how we all work in the space, right? Because we're always very competitive and, and it's yeah. a very competitive industry. But without a sense of cohesiveness for our best interests that are aligned, we, we can't effectively do our job. We can't effectively secure our business models going forward. And we can't effectively evolve into the future, which we all know is crucial to our survival. So I strongly believe in coming together, like-minded individuals and uh, the companies that are members of IFTA being in a cohesive environment to protect our business models and most importantly to protect movies and vision. You know, censorship comes in many different forms. Censorship is not always about something that's been made and then edited out or bleeped out. Censorship can also be the difficulty of not making something, right? And that's a really interesting thought. So if you have obstacles or challenges to make something, that is also a form of censorship because uh, a vision is not getting created. And so that's one of the other important roles that IFTA plays is to protect the vision, the voices of the independents. And I think in a, in a general bird's eye view, that's probably the most important thing that we do is protect that vision and voice of the independents. Right, and maybe on a more kind of concrete, practical uh, way, do you take part in the brainstorming uh, uh, with, the, with the staff about uh, the, the, the way the show is, uh, is, is, is going, is, is being held. And, so so that, that, that's a good point to clarify. So if does the trade organization of independent distributors and sales agents, as I described, and IFTA also organizes the American film market. And the AFM is then the market for us to do our business here, obviously. And so the board of directors, we're not trade event coordinators or planners, right? We're film producers yes. and sales agents. But there are some matters that the board advises the AFM staff on at, at a high level, at a very high level. Um, but certainly we're not, uh, we're not advising them on price of furniture rental or, mm. or screenings or something like that, right? We're not event planners, but certainly we're there to support them. Uh, we're certainly there to spread the word and to encourage people to come. And we're all certainly all here, of course. Um, I've been coming to AFM for over 20 years. I started out as an assistant uh, for a large company. I think my first AFM was in 1999. And I remember I was on the eighth floor. I don't remember the, the actual office number, but I remember I was on the eighth floor <laughs> in the corner of the hallway. And I've been coming to AFM ever since. Uh, and it's, it's a special place to be because like I said, it's the only event um, year-round throughout the world that is only for independent films. You have film festivals, you have other conferences around the world, and you have other sor sorts of events, but it's the only organization, uh, the only event that truly is devoted to independent filmmaking. Yeah. For everyone who is coming uh, regularly to the AFM, it is going to be it's going to require a little bit of adjustment uh, of not seeing uh, Jonathan Wolf around for uh, who, who was there for the past 24 years or something and and I must say I was a little bit almost shocked I was in Cannes when uh, the news broke that both Jerome and uh, and and Jonathan were were 
uh, were leaving their, their position, their job. So that's why filmfestivals.com actually organized a little, uh, a little cocktail where we gave them a, a little souvenir in form of a, 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 a modified uh, uh, artist view of the uh, Cannes Festival poster. Oh, wow. That's very cool. I'd like to see that. I haven't seen it. That's oh, really, I'll show you. I'll show you. Really, it was really a, nice. It was pretty, yeah. uh, so it was a, a, a very warm uh, moment and I really enjoyed being there. Oh, it's really nice. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I, I haven't met the new team, but I'm sure they will be uh, uh, fantastic and um, I can't wait to meet them. Um, Click. could we now uh, switch to your other hat as founder of uh, of film mode, you, I can't, we don't have time enough to list the number of sales company and positions you, you've held. Uh, I've heard a lot of great things about you. We've wrote, we, we've written a lot of good things about interviews as well. Vanessa uh, did one. Yes, recently. yes, I appreciate and, uh, the support. Yeah. And uh, so we, I'm, I'm happy to have, uh, to be sitting here and uh, having a little bit of your views on, on what's changing, what's uh, the uh, uh, online events have added, what dimension has, has it added uh, to, to your job as, as a sales agent uh, as a, uh, and a buyer. And, uh, and lastly, maybe what you, it's gonna be the, the, the last question, maybe uh, after we do that, is uh, the role of a changing role of film festivals or not. Well, thank you to filmfestivals.com for supporting uh, us and, the, and myself and the companies. I do appreciate that. You have given us great coverage through the years. But thank yes, you. my other hat, my hat where that actually pays me a salary <laughs> because um, I don't, you know, working, uh, not working, being on the board and the chairperson is, is strictly a volunteer basis. And yeah. it's my privilege and honor to, to do that. But we all have to, of course, make a living. And so... Um, I, I own a company, uh, Film Mode Entertainment. We're celebrating our sixth year anniversary, which is quite a feat in such a consolidating and, and challenging industry. And I've held head of sales positions prior to that at, at various companies. But I wanted to start a company six years ago that had the vision to work with excellent talent um, and to be able to work with filmmakers that we have like-minded um, thoughts about how to make movies and vision and the type of stories we want to tell. We don't stick to one particular genre. Mm -hmm. We represent films from all different genres. We have a new horror thriller uh, that's going to be directed by the Soska sisters that Ted Fields is, is producing. He produced the che Texas Chainsaw Massacre and, um, and the Middleville Project and uh, Riddick. Um, and Jumanji franchise, so incredible mm. filmmakers. Sure. Sure. And we also had amazing success with our family dramedy this year with Dustin Hoffman and Candace Bergen and Simon Helberg and Diana Agron, which was directed by Maya Bialik called As They Made Us. And so everything in between, but I say that because we're really drawn by the, the stories and by the filmmakers, not necessarily by the genre. Um, As a um when 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 you see uh, 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 when someone brings a project to you what what makes you say yes well the easiest projects are when they're completely packaged with wonderful cast filmmakers ready yeah. to go finance and they just need <laughs> us to help secure distribution but that ha happens so rarely today right that's such a challenge and sales agents are really evolving into different uh, sorts of companies that do a lot more than just selling the distribution rights. Most of the sales agents now have some form of production, they're producing, executive producing. Many of the sales agents are getting into dis distribution as well. Uh, and at Film Mode, we are executive producing the majority of our slate. Um, and that really means when projects come to us that are not made yet, they may be a script, a director, a producer, a cast some some variation of attachments and they need us to help push the project almost like a a, a big um, a big stone up a hill uh, to try and get it to the next step to get the project fully financed into production and then into distribution and that executive producer work 
really varies from project to project depending on the needs of the producer. It might be creative input, it might be uh, help financially uh, in terms of raising finance from the marketplace or from partners. It may help introductions to um, location managers or casting agents. I've even brought on editors and DPs to projects before that needed them. So it really depends on the need of the project. So I see ourselves as a partner. We become a partner to the producers and the production to help them in any way that they need help. Um, but the most important factor for us, for us, uh, for us to say yes, let's put forth the bandwidth and the energy of the company, is who's producing the project. So if it's a credible producer and good material, and it's a producer that has a track record of getting films into production, then we are more than happy to come on board early and if it's a producer that doesn't have the track record or the experience or the filmography to prove themselves yet then we, we may wait a little bit longer until they get further down the line unless they had a really great cast or a great director or ip that compensates for that lack of experience well that the new definition of a job um, requires uh, multiple talents, in fact, and yeah. it's kind of hard to be both creative, a good salesperson, a good uh, exec producer, and, 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 and having the right financing contacts uh, where, where, where necessary. Uh, what, what's, uh, what's the new, where do, you, where do we come from, these people? Where well, you... um, it's true, and, and I say to my staff, I never ask you to do anything I haven't done myself in the past um, and you're absolutely correct in saying that the skill set of uh, entertainment executive today has changed and evolved drastically from what it was before uh, i believe that every successful person in our business has an angle uh, and or a hook that enables them to achieve success uh, fundamentally the most fundamental level is a lot of money if a lot of if you have a lot of money and, and you're a good uh, uh, talker, uh, you might be able to achieve some success. But for those of us that don't have um, the, the mass amounts of capital or, or a background in investment banking uh, per se, or raising money just uh, for the sake of raising money, um, you do need you know, a multiple amount of skill sets. I went to film school, so my background is, is production and story development. Um, so I do have a an understanding of how films are physically made uh, and how a DP works, how an editor works, how a screenwriter works. And so even though I don't have decades of experience uh, as a DP or a writer, I certainly can have um, a conversation with a screenwriter on development of their story and, and how to, you know, kind of work on that script to improve it uh, for the marketplace. I can have a, a pretty decent conversation with the DP. I'm certainly not familiar with what lenses or, or, or cameras necessarily, and that's not what oh, my job. Would, it's not what my job would be, right? And it changes yeah. so fast. Yeah. But I can have a conversation with the DP and say, you know what? We need camera movement. We need this. We need that because that's going to increase production value. We need coverage. I can talk about the ratio of coverage. I can watch dailies and gauge more or less what they may be getting or not getting. So from a from a production perspective. Um, I have enough experience and education to be helpful um, and then having worked at various companies, sales companies and distribution companies, I have a very good understanding of how distribution works and how marketing works. I have a lot of experience in marketing and I started in the industry at the ground up. I answered phones and did errands and worked my way up through the years and so I have relationships with graphic designers and printers and um, screening rooms and shipping companies and film markets and film festivals and um, different sorts of relationships that you don't build if you start uh, in the middle on up. You yeah. only can build those relationships if you start at the bottom. So uh, don't know, get me wrong, I may have been complaining at the time, uh -huh. um, but I certainly am really grateful that I started answering phones and doing errands and meeting everyone at the bottom uh, because 20 plus years later I have those relationships and I have that knowledge 
and appreciation of, of all the areas that it takes to get a movie made and into distribution. But you know, Clay, I have heard that before. Uh, and uh, and uh, I do remember two of my early, my bosses when I was uh, running the Sony in France yeah. started, one was Pat Williamson, I forgot the second one, both started really down. One was uh, in charge of delivering the faxes of the paperwork. And, I've done it. And he started, <laughs> faxes. He started reading those. Yeah, of course. And, well, if you weren't reading them, you weren't doing your job. Right? Yeah. <laughs> You're supposed to read. I, I had a boss, uh, my first boss, um, I worked for very large, well, large within the independent space, 80 or 90 uh, employees. And at the time, one of the top sales uh, company distribution and, and production company. And when I moved on and got a job elsewhere, he called me into his office and I was quite uh, scared, really. I mean, this is the big boss calling me to the office. I thought he'd be yelling at something. <laughs> and he said, uh, have you been sneaking in here on the weekends, uh, videotaping a short film and reading the faxes and, and taking advantage of the stuff around here, the, the editing machine? <laughs> and I was like scared and stuttering and looking at him. And I said, uh, I, you know, I have to be honest, uh, I, I have been doing all of those things. And he said, good. Because if you hadn't been doing all those things, you weren't doing your job properly and you're not going to grow in this business. So he, he kind of gave me that assurance that, uh, again, I wasn't stealing anything. I wasn't being sneaky. I wasn't doing anything that was just helping what that, that was jeopardizing the company. But was I taking advantage of the opportunity to learn and to uh, make my short film using their office space on the weekends? I, I was doing that. But he saw he saw that that's what it takes to succeed in this business right it's about respect um it's 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 about learning it's about being patient and it's about taking things seriously right if you want to just be rich and famous you're in the wrong business it's going to take too long and the the odds are against you um mm -hmm. but if you want to be a filmmaker and you want to tell stories and you want to work and have a career in the industry then like any other thing in life, you have to learn how to do it, you have to take it seriously, and you have to be proactive. Um, one really hot question I have on my mind is the, how, do you, how do you work on your intuition of um, what the film is going to make? Uh, huh. How do you do that? Yeah, um, I think what you're asking is how do we do estimates? Kind of. That's yes. what you're asking, yes. Bruno. How do we do <laughs> estimates? Well, well, hold, hold on, because yeah. estimates can be kind of an Excel work. Yes. So I, I'm really trying to find behind the vision. What, uh, how do you, uh, b before putting the figures well, on? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna answer that with a with a, a thought or a question. Yeah. Oh, you're right. Um, in our independent space, right, unlike studios, studios control distribution, meaning if they want to make a film and put it into 3,000 theaters, they have the control both financially and infrastructurally to do that. In the independent space, we make something and hope people will come, right? It really is field of dreams. We yeah. build it and hope they will come because we don't have the financial means or the distribution infrastructure to make it happen, right? We have to hope it will be good enough, it will be commercial yeah. enough, and decision makers in distribution or in A-list festivals or critics that are very influential will embrace it and things will start to happen in a snowball effect, right? You can't guarantee a premiere at Sundance. No one can guarantee that. You have to hope, you have to, you know, do everything you can to make it possible, but no one can guarantee that. And there are only a small right. number of films each year that can premiere at Sundance and that can uh, get the critics to rally behind it. And they can then sell for a lot of money to a studio. There are very few films that that happens to. So to give the films the best opportunity really falls into the commerciality of it, right? So for the lack of all the marketing dollars the independents have, the film has to have commercial ingredients. That's commercial script, cast, and execution, right? That's why you see so many action films with a, with a Liam Neeson type of star, because an action film with Liam Neeson has intrinsic commercial value, right? If you do a drama with a different level of actor, that film has to be executed so well and get into Sundance and be embraced by the critics and be 
embraced by the distributors and get into a bidding war, it's you have a better chance of winning the lottery. Right? Mm -hmm. So the intuition comes from really what's commercial. And when I say commercial, what has the potential to have a wide audience and what has intrinsic value, right? Despite a level of execution. And do you think this has become more difficult because of the various outlets, the various channels, the variety of news, yeah. streamers? Yeah, it used to be, that, you know, there's even though there might be more digital opportunity to just get your film available on a platform, because anyone can put their film uh, on Amazon Direct, I believe, or even on iTunes, if you have the right technical requirements, you can get your film on iTunes. But no one's going to know it's there if you don't have a distributor to place it properly on the platform, to promote it, and do all of those things that the distributor does to make sure that when a consumer logs into iTunes or Amazon, they see it available to rent or to buy. Yeah. That's the power of a distributor. Yeah. Uh, maybe the last question, and this is uh, really uh, very exciting. Uh, what, uh, how do you see the role of film festivals Um, uh, not in general, but uh, as it, uh, for uh, sales agents, how important are right. they for well, you, for your business and your sales? Uh, I had been asked multiple times during COVID and soon after uh, the pandemic was, I mean, we're still kind of in the pandemic, but soon uh, after people were starting to come out of their, their quarantines, uh, do we need film markets? Do we need film festivals? Well, I have two answers to that. First, We want film festivals and film markets, and that's a very important statement. We want them, right? And number two, nothing can take the place of in-person experience watching a film on a big screen. Shared. Right? And yeah. so from a salesperson's perspective, from a producer's perspective, from a filmmaker's perspective, I think film festivals will have an even more important role going forward as the business consolidates and it gets saturated within itself. Even though it's consolidating, it will still be saturated um, in terms of the amount of films, right? Uh, there's still more films than distributors need. And so with that saturation, the film festivals give uh, really two, two opportunities to filmmakers. Uh, one, an opportunity to show their film to an audience despite its capability of getting distribution. And number two, uh, the opportunity to get noticed and discovered so the film could get distribution and more importantly the filmmaker can launch a career out of that discovery yeah and also make uh, meet people build a team and uh, and yeah, network you cannot network yeah. digitally it's impossible yeah. you need to be able to go to events and meet people and i was at a film festival it was a new newport film festival we premiered manifest yes. west two weeks mm -hmm. ago uh i we had a wonderful time The filmmakers were there, the talent was there, there was a great Q&A, the audience enjoyed it. Uh, it. The dynamic and that energy in a room to see the film on the screen and see it with the filmmakers and the talent, nothing can replace that. Yeah, I have a personal note as a story to share here. Um, when I was at Sony, I, I brought, uh, we brought Boys in the Hood to Cannes. And that's the first time in my career where I could put a figure on what the film festival can do to a film. You know, sometimes you hear people say the Oscar can bring uh, yeah. 10, 20%, whatever. Here, after we were very successful launching the film uh, in Cannes for the first time ever, yeah. um, the, the head of a studio from Price uh, said, thank you, Bruno, thank you, team. You did a great job and the film got a great, I'm gonna, first thing I do back in the office is change the box office estimate. I had 30, I'm gonna put 50, well, yeah. US, US Canada, yeah. right? Yeah. So basically, is, we were saying like 40, yeah. 50, Massive. 45, Massive. Uh, it's huge. And in fact, they did more. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, to I me, it, it tells a, a very strong story, yeah. which uh, festivals can make. Uh, can be a fairy yeah. tale. They can make a career. John Singleton was nominated to to the two Oscars, etc. So I've seen that it yeah. can happen. So yeah. it's worth it. Of yeah. course, Sony put a lot of money and energy, and they had a big team behind. But uh, it, it's uh, it's worth it. Festivals yeah. are uh, pretty important. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. 
So I'm glad we share the same. Good. Uh, yes, me too. <laughs> especially since I'm uh, strictly uh, uh, devoting from yeah. festivals.com to the festival circuit. Yeah, so it's, uh, there's a reason for that. Well, we're, we're, we're supporting. So. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Clay. Thank you so much for sharing. Pleasure. Your, thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah.